For as we have read from your holy word this day about the ancient custom of sacrifices, of animal sacrifices, and the offering of, of animals and the shedding of blood, Lord, we're mindful on this communion Sunday that Christ shed his blood, sacrificing himself for us, for paying the price for our sins. <coughs> Lord, we pray this day that as we meditate on this, this, this faith, faith fact that we may have greater understanding and appreciation of all that Christ has done for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We begin a new month that's filled with news in the world of sports. Tonight's football Super Bowl will be played. The 22nd Winter Olympics begin in Sochi, Russia, <coughs> Russia this week. And the continuing seasons of basketball and hockey are going and Baseball spring training begins in less than three weeks. <laughs> February, which you don't really think of as a big sports month, is going to be very busy this year. I'm going to use the images from baseball since that's the sport I'm most familiar. But many of these images are transferable to other sporting events. The crowd stands and sings the national anthem. Someone throws out the first pitch or there's a coin toss, whichever, whichever sporting metaphor you want to use. People wear goofy outfits and take a seventh inning stretch. And they sing, baseball, take me out to the ball game. And they buy overpriced hot dogs. <laughs> Most of them will never know that what they are doing is religion. An unbeliever once asked, why do Christians need to do all the rituals like communion. Why don't they just preach what they believe? To think about an answer for this question, think about the baseball game with over many, many thousands of people singing, reciting creeds or pledges, and feeling a sense of unity, even with the opposing team. And as they sing about buying peanuts and cracker jacks. It must have been similar more than two and a half millennia ago, when the ancient Greeks gathered for the first Olympics a series of games and rituals designed to give glory to their gods. Rituals are simply what human beings do. Rituals make us feel close to one another and to God. They take away our guilt. They comfort us in times of stress. They remind people of what they believe and teach them values of their culture. Regardless of which teams we root for, we love the games themselves. And we don't care if we ever go back. It must have been the same way in the temple. The psalmist says that one day in the temple courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. And he envies even the sparrow who makes its nest in a corner of the building. This was the place where people could come to formally wipe the slate clean, to start their relationship with God all over again. We are far away from the smoky slaughterhouse smell of the ancient temple, the sound of bells and the bleeding of sheep. Our Christian churches have a different smells, wood polish and floor wax, flowers, carpets, candles. So when the author of this book of Hebrews starts talking about high priests and blood and goats and bulls and sacrifice, some of us may have a hard time relating to those images. We're much more comfortable with football and baseball and the Olympics. Blood has always been a symbol of both life and death. The ancient Israelites believed that the creature's life force was in its blood, and therefore blood was holy to God. If someone was murdered, God was supposed to be able to hear their blood crying from the ground. And if you killed an animal for food, you were forbidden to drink its blood. Instead, you had to offer its blood back to God. When the Israelites escaped from Egypt on the night of Passover, they painted their doors with the blood of a lamb and so that the angel of death would know which houses to avoid and to pass over them and protect them um, as the 
angel of death was, was taking the firstborn children. There are numerous hymns that mention fountains filled with blood and believers being washed by the blood of the Lamb. When we sing about these images, it's best not to literally picture such things, perhaps. A fountain filled with blood. Sounds like a scene from a horror movie, doesn't it? Yet we have hymns like, There is power in the blood. Are you washed in the blood? And there's a fountain filled with blood. There's numerous other hymns. But this fascination with blood seems pretty grisly. But in the ancient world, blood was viewed as the divine source of life. And actually, when we stop and think about it, we have not come that far in our thinking. We still say someone is hot-blooded if they're passionate. We refer, we refer to a cold-blooded killer or a blue-blooded noble. We ascribe cultural attributes to blood. He is Irish or Italian or Native American or African or Asian blood. We speak of people having musical or athletic talent in their blood. Blood is the stuff that beats through our hearts and fuels our passions. Abraham Lincoln had the audacity to stand at Gettysburg and call the battlefield holy because it had been hallowed with the spilled blood of fallen soldiers. Pouring out his life willingly, Jesus enacted an ancient ritual that changes who we are. Sometimes, followers of Christ, hearing so often about how he takes our place on the cross, think that sacrifice and punishment are the same thing. But it's important to remember that the animals slaughtered on temple altars were not being punished for the sins of the people. When we talk about Jesus as the perfect sacrifice for our sins, it does not mean that someone had to be killed in order to appease an angry God's thirst for vengeance. It's something much deeper than that. A blood ritual that reminds us of where life comes from and where it goes. Jesus' death on the cross was more than just a terrible injustice, says the author of Hebrews. It was more than just an inspiring act of nonviolent resistance. It was more than a ritual that makes us feel better. It was cosmic, inclusive, comprehensive, limitless, and transcendent. It altered the very fabric of reality. Jesus' actions of offering his own blood, that divine, life-giving substance, somehow made possible a new relationship between human beings and God. Our faith, says the author of Hebrews, is not in a set of rituals and dramatic actions that make us feel better. Our faith is in a God who acted once and for all on our behalf. So the author invites us to imagine Jesus as the cosmic priest performing a glorious ritual outside of time. The cross becomes not merely an ugly, upright pole upon which Jesus is nailed. It's an altar, crude but beautiful, surrounded with the smoke and the incense. And although we may see and envision Jesus bound, naked, and bloody, when we look through the eyes of today's scripture writer, Jesus wears the robe of a priest, and he ascends the steps to the altar of his own free will. The blood falling from his wrists, his side, his scalp, and his torn back is no longer a reminder of pain and injustice, but the life-giving substance that Jesus offers back to God, his own essence, and his own life force, and by doing so, he purifies Watching this spectacle are not only his mother and a few courageous followers, but every human being who has ever lived and will ever walk our planet. They have to decide for themselves whether you know, the statement of faith is true for them. Like the crowd at a baseball game, root and root and 
rooting for their home team, those standing around the cross and watching the execution of Jesus have no idea what they are doing is religion. It's a ritual, a ritual that Jesus did for us. And we have an opportunity to reenact that cosmic ritual each time we share in the Lord's Supper. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for the cross, for the blood-stained, upright and cross piece that shows us how much Jesus loves us, that he willingly went there, paying the price for our sins, not because he had to, because he wanted to, because he loves us so much. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his blood. We thank you for his broken body. Lord, we pray now that you would prepare us as we move to the time of celebrating the Lord's Supper, that we will focus on Jesus' broken body and shed blood with thanksgiving for all that he has done and all that he is doing and will do for us in the future. Lord, we ask this now in his most precious and powerful name. Amen. Sunday, we collect um, a second offering. And the deacons use these gifts um, to help them meet the needs of um, those in this church, um, those in the Malta community, and even across this country and across this world. So the deacons are not collected to the this community. We come to the table that uh, Jesus is, is the host. And as the host, each time we come, Jesus asks us, do you love me? Do you believe that I went to the cross allowing my body to be broken, my blood to be shed, paying the price for your sins, and dying there, being buried, rising again, and going to heaven to prepare a place for you for all eternity. And if we are able to say, yes, Lord, I love you. I believe in that. I believe you did that. Then Jesus says, come, eat and drink with me. You do not have to be a, a member of this local congregation. In order to receive the elements today, for Jesus invites all who accept him as Lord and Savior to partake of the elements. Let's pray together this morning. Lord, we come knowing that we have not earned a seat at your table. It is only through your grace and your mercy that we are, can be welcomed here. So in these moments, Lord, we silently confess to you those sins that we are aware of and pray and ask for your forgiveness. Lord, thank you for hearing our confessions. And we do now pray that you would forgive us of our sins, cleanse us, purify us, and prepare us now to eat and drink with you. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. In the night before the crucifixion, Jesus shared a final meal with his followers. And it was the Passover meal, remembering of when the Israelites were coming out of Egypt and the angel of death passed over their door folks, because the blood of the lamb had been put on the door. And so in this meal, Jesus took bread, a part of that meal, and gave thanks to God and began breaking it and telling his disciples, this bread represents my body that's broken for each of you. And he said, whenever you eat this bread, remember me. Ministering in his name, we share with you the broken bread.
And as the meal and the apple room continued, Jesus took the cup and gave thanks to God for the cup and began passing it to his disciples, telling them, this cup represents a new covenant, a new agreement between God and humans that's sealed with my blood. And as often as you drink it, remember me. Ministering in his name, we share with you the cup. <laughs> shed there for us. We pray, O oh God, that through that act, that we may become your followers, we may become your children, that forever and ever we may have a place in heaven. Through Jesus Christ. Amen. Scripture tells the disciples and Jesus sang him and then went out. Thank you. 